guys. Welcome to today's episode. And I'm so excited to introduce back Dr. Ken Berry, who's written the book, Lies My Doctor Told Me. He's got a second edition out. It's the medical myths that can harm your health. He's got a huge YouTube channel. So if you haven't followed him on there, you've got to do it. And we have a really exciting episode. So welcome, Dr. Ken Berry. Hey, thanks. Good to be with you. So one of the things that I want to talk about is, first, before we do, I'd love for you to give us a kind of a glimpse into your book, Lies My Doctor Told Me. Give us like three of your favorite parts in there, and then I'll have some listener questions to ask you. So doctors are very busy. We all know that. And they don't have a lot of time, and they don't make a lot of time to keep up with the latest research. And so what winds up happening is doctors practice medicine out of habit, right? This is the way I've always done it. Therefore, that's the way I'm going to continue to do it. Or they'll practice medicine based on what their, their, their colleagues believe to be true, which, again, can be 10 to 20 years old. And so you wind up with a doctor whose duty it is to give you good health advice, good medical advice, and, in my opinion, good nutrition advice. But you wind up with a doctor, although well-meaning and earnest, who's giving you <clears throat> information and advice that was outdated 10, 15, 20 years ago that we now know that is absolutely not only not helpful, but in some cases actually can be harmful. And uh, out of these, out of the, the 27 or 28 lies in the book that I go into detail about, one that sticks out is that uh, you should eat lots of whole grains. And uh, the, first of all, human beings have only been eating whole grains as any significant portion of their diet for about one-tenth of one percent of our time on this planet. So whole grains are a relatively new food for human beings if you look at the totality of our, our time on this planet. And so I think that any time we recommend a new food or a new source of nutrition, that source should be thoroughly investigated with randomized controlled trials and make sure that it's safe for the majority of humans before we ever start to recommend that. But it's became very popular and faddish to recommend to patients to eat lots of whole grains. But when you actually look at the research, uh, there's a large percentage of, of, of humans on the planet that should never eat whole grains. They're going to have some sort of inflammatory response or some sort of autoimmune response, grains by definition are high in carbohydrates, even the whole grains. And so even someone who doesn't react with an infl inflammatory reaction or doesn't have an autoimmune response is still, it's going to be too many carbohydrates for them. And so if their goal is weight loss or weight maintenance, they're going to wind up failing at that goal because they're following this nutrition advice their doctor gave them, and it sounds believable. You know, you don't want to eat highly processed grains, of course. Uh, everybody knows that's bad. So, but whole grains, that, that sounds like, well, I guess that makes sense. And people wind up unable to achieve their weight loss goals, unable to maintain their weight loss because they're, eating, they're just eating too many carbohydrates on a daily basis. So whole grain is good for you. That's a huge lie for virtually everybody listening. Another one is, if you're going to dr drink or eat dairy, it should absolutely be skim milk or low-fat or fat-free dairy, right? Uh, and so again, this, this sounds good because, you know, if you eat fat, it'll make you fat, right? Actually, no, but that's, you know, if people are not nutritionists or dietitians, that makes sense, eat fat, get fat, that, it even rhymes. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that weight loss is not about eating uh, fat. Eating fat will slow down your weight loss. That's not true at all. Uh, and then uh, a gram of fat has more calories than a gram of carbohydrate or a gram of protein. And so if you're still counting calories for weight loss, it also seems to make sense that if you drink full fat milk or eat full fat cheese, that that's going to be too many calories and that, that'll make you gain weight. Again, absolutely not true and thoroughly disproven. And so another, so that's another big lie is that if you eat whole, uh, drink lots of skim milk, that'll help you with your weight loss goals. Absolutely not true at all. Uh, if you look at the basic physiology and just some basic research, you'll quickly see 
that skim milk is a very high carbohydrate food paired with potentially inflammatory bovine uh, proteins. Just not, it's not a human food at all. And so of all the spectrum of ingesting dairy, skim milk would be on the, the end of the spectrum that I would consider the least beneficial and most inflammatory and most harmful. So that absolutely never should fat-free or skim anything, any dairy ever cross your lips if optimal nutri nutrition, optimal health, and uh, being close to your ideal body weight, if those are your goals, skim milk's not a part of that. It can't be. And then I guess the third lie that's my favorite is that if you want young looking healthy skin, if you want to avoid skin cancer, then you need to stay out of the sun. You need to live in a cave. And if you're going to even be in indirect sunlight, you should put on SPF 30 sunscreen. And we all want to have young, attractive skin. None of us want skin cancer. And so, it, you know, when you're out in the sun on a summer day, the sun is pretty bright and it feels pretty hot. And so if you don't, if you're not a dermatologist and have studied all the meaningful research, you might believe this and go, well, yeah, I can tell. And if I stay in the sun too long, it burns my skin. So therefore, the, the sun must be bad for my skin. When in reality, human beings have been playing in the sun, mostly naked since we've been on this planet. And it's only since about the 1960s and 70s that somehow the sun has magically become dangerous and might cause skin cancer and definitely is going to have, make you have that wrinkled leather old skin. Well, the problem is, is that's never been proven. Neither of those things have ever been proven. And secondly, it doesn't make any sense from an ancestral standpoint. You know, it'd be like telling you that drinking water, oh, we just discovered that's bad for you. Don't drink water. Or don't, drink, don't breathe air. We've discovered breathing air is bad for you. Stop breathing. What? And, and so saying that, that sunlight is somehow bad for human beings or dangerous makes just as much sense as saying that breathing air is bad for you or drinking water is bad for you. Because we've been doing all those things since we've been on this planet. And some people will bring up the ozone depletion and say, well, the ozone's not as thick as it used to be. Therefore, more ultraviolet radiation is getting to your skin. Again, not true. If you measure ultraviolet radiation standing on the equator or standing up at a northern latitude like in northern Norway, there's about a 50,000 percent difference in the amount of UV radiation. So the, the ozone hasn't depleted enough to make to even matter. It's maybe a one or two or three percent increase in ultraviolet radiation. And so when you look at the, the difference in latitudes, you're talking about tens of thousands of percent. So the, the depletion of the ozone causing an increase in ultraviolet radiation exposure is trivial. It's background, it, it's literally static on the radio. It, may, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Sunlight is good for human beings in multiple different ways. Most people know about the vitamin D angle. Yeah, you make vitamin D from cholesterol when you're out in the sun. Also, you increase your nitric oxide production, which lowers your blood pressure, you the sun the sunlight is basically an antioxidant there's no research that shows that being out in the sun and developing a healthy tan is going to in any way aid your skin whatsoever uh putting spf in makeup and, and and you know every human has to be covered in spf 30 before they go outside is a humongous waste of time and money and many of the sunscreens as you're probably aware have came to the, uh, you know, we've seen in the media, they actually contain carcinogens. And so in an effort to prevent skin cancer from sun exposure, we're actually exposing ourselves to more chemicals that are much more, much more carcinogenic or cancer causing than sunlight ever was or ever will be. So that, those are probably my three favorite lies in the book. I love that you say that. I actually never wear sunscreen ever. Neither, ever. And I have yeah. very pale skin. So yeah. for me, you know, everyone's like, I can't believe you don't wear sunscreen. So I do get a spray tan with an organic spray tan. So like right now, if you look at me, it looks like I have a lot of sun, but I actually have an organic spray tan on. So if I'm going somewhere like Florida and I know I'm going to spend, I, I'll get a spray tan, but I never ever, even organic sunscreen. I just don't do it because it's like, it just 
for me to put all that on there, if I need to get out of the sun, I'll have an umbrella or I'll wear a shirt or something like that. But I yeah. never, ever wear sunscreen. Yeah, when you've gotten enough sun for the day, the perfect strategy and really the only strategy that human beings have ever had on this planet is this very technical, complicated thing called shade. <laughs> so when you when your sun st skin's starting to get pink, you've had enough sun exposure, get in the shade. That's what we've always done, and that's what we should continue to do. And that can be a long sleeve shirt, that can be a wide brimmed hat, that can be an umbrella, or it can be a nice, well positioned tree that you get under. But all those things will protect you from the sun better than any sunscreen on the planet. And also, trees and and hats and shirts don't cause skin cancer. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and ask you a question. This is from Sandy in Akron, Ohio. Never heard of that. She says, I'm doing just like your book says, and I've been eating one meal and a tasting every day. I've lost 15 pounds in one month. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love all the tips and hacks in your book, but I have a strange question. I've been seeing all these TikTok episodes about chlorophyll and how it helps with your skin. And everywhere I go, I see liquid chlorophyll, liquid chlorophyll that it helps to treat acne. And I'm seeing these drastic videos on TikTok that seem too good to be true. I don't no. believe it. What do you know about this and how does it actually help? Is this a gimmick? Yeah, this is 100% a gimmick. Okay, 100%. I've seen those, I've seen the TikTok videos too. I'm working on a YouTube video about this. So chlorophyll is what makes all plants green. OK, so if you if you want to try this, all you have to do is put some broccoli in the blender or some grass from the front yard in the blender, blend it up, puree it and rub it on your skin or ingest it. Either way, it doesn't matter. But you're going to be getting much more chlorophyll from that than you are from these products. And so, first of all, rubbing chlorophyll on your skin is complete foolishness because the chlorophyll molecule is is huge. It's never going to be absorbed through the, the, the stratum corneum of your skin, which is the little layer of dead outer cells that protects us, you're not gonna absorb any of the chlorophyll through the skin. T ingesting it by mouth, you're gonna absorb it, but your stomach acidity is immediately gonna break it down into its constituent parts. So again, it's not gonna make it to your skin ever. So this is the latest fad. You know, for a while it was drinking uh, celery juice, green, green juice, all these things, and now that's kind of dying down. People fall for fats. We fall for this stuff. And uh, there's literally not an ounce of truth. There's no research to back the chlorophyll gimmick up. There, there's nothing there. It's just not. So if you want chlorophyll, eat plants because every green plant has chlorophyll in it. But if you're about to spend 20, 30, 50, 100 bucks on some chlorophyll product, you're about to waste your money and fall for the latest fad. And if you want to do that, it's fine. I don't think it's harmful in any way. It's not going to hurt you. But it's just a waste of money. It's worthless. It's never going to help. Yeah. And I agree. It's like they're, the, what they're trying to do is if it has, it has this tiny bit of benefit, like a microscopic amount, and then they'll be like, they'll show somebody coming in with <laughs> like this horrible acne skin. And then all of a sudden it's like, woo, I've got this gorgeous skin appearing. Yep. It's insane. And the fact that people believe it is just blows my mind of how they say, okay, this is, this is true. Yeah. And so if anybody watching, if you actually suffer from acne to a significant degree, it's very simple to reverse your acne back to, to baseline. You, you got to stop all the dairy, any liquid dairy, you got to stop that. There's tons of research that shows that low fat skim dairy makes acne much, much worse. And it's because of the inflammatory bovine hormones and bovine proteins that are in the milk. That's what's causing that. Uh, human beings should not drink milk as adults uh, or even as teenagers. About the age of four, five, or six years old, that's when you lose the ability to benefit from drinking milk. And this happens to the majority of people on this planet. So get rid of all the dairy except for full fat cheeses, butter, ghee, 
and maybe some heavy cream. They don't have enough. They they have all they have all, virtually none of the lactose with the milk sugar, and they have very very little of the inflammatory milk proteins. That's going to help a ton. And then there's also a ton of research showing that eating a low carbohydrate diet when you do eat, you can eat as much as you want. You're not going to calorie count or portion control but you're gonna control the carbohydrate intake. And if you eat a low carbohydrate diet, that's, a, that's free of the, the high carb, high protein dairies, your acne is gonna get so much better. You're not gonna waste any money on a chlorophyll product or any other product, you won't need it. Hey guys, I'm so excited. My new book, One Meal and a Tasting is out now. And if you order the book on Amazon, just the regular paperback edition, if you go in and make a review, you will get the audio book for free. Send a copy of your receipt to questions at chantelrayway.com and you'll get the audio book right away. Mm. All right. Well, this goes good for our next question from Belinda in Fort Collins, Colorado. When I take too many grains and too much dairy out of my diet, I see my weight go down and I feel so much better, but I might do it for a week maybe two, and then I will binge. I need some hacks to help me not go off the wagon. So yeah, don't we all, right? Uh, I, th I think the, the longer you stay low carb or keto, the easier it gets. There is definitely a component of sugar addiction. And I think the very fact that she used the word binge, right? I think that I think that's very telling for her and indeed for hundreds of thousands of other people. Yeah, some people are alcoholics and they have to drink every day, right? But there are other people who are alcoholics and they only binge on the weekends or one, one or two weekends a month. They, they won't drink at all through the day. And so what the question asked her, she's basically a binge carbohydrate addict. That's what it sounds like uh, because dairy has carbohydrates. If it's, if it's milk, for sure, or if it's any of the low-fat dairy, it's going to be high in carbohydrates. And then also the, the grains are super high in carbohydrates and grains in and of themselves can stimulate the parts of your brain that lead to addiction. But then just the carbohydrates on top of that are ultimately going to break down into sugar, which also, also stimulate the parts of your brain that handle addiction and addictive behavior. So it sounds like she needs to look in the mirror and say, I'm a carboholic, I'm a sugar addict, and I'm going to have to deal with that. And you would use exactly the same strategies as an alcoholic would use to break the addiction cycle and then stay on the wagon. You would do, use the same exact strategies that somebody's addicted to cigarettes. The same strategies apply to sugar addiction as well. So, you know, you want to be around a group of people like Alcoholics Anonymous. So you want to join a Facebook group that can hold you accountable or you want to do this low carb thing, you want to do it with a friend or two, and you guys can hold each other accountable. And that way, when you're starting to feel the craving, you're feeling that binge coming like, man, I'm, I'm about to eat the entire Sara Lee coffee cake, right? Then you can reach out to that friend and, and your sponsor, in other words, and say, hey, I'm, I'm feeling the craving bad. Let's go do something. Let's, you know, call me on the phone. Let's talk about this. You have to use the same strategies that any other addict would use to ultimately break this addiction. But I think the, the really the most powerful first step is recognizing that's what it is. And so don't think of yourself, I'm a loser, I'm a glutton, I just, I, I suck. None of that stuff's true. You just have an addiction. And I think sugar and carbohydrate addiction is much more powerful in some people than in other people just like alcohol addiction and just like cigarette addiction, some people can take it or leave it. Other people get hooked. And I am, a, I'm a sugar holic. I'm a sugar addict. There's no doubt about it. Unless I'm eating very clean, very, very low carbohydrate, I'll start to have the cravings and I'll start to have the, the desire. Like, I wonder if there's any of that stuff left in the, in the top cabinet. Right. And I, so I just, I have to eat super low carb every single day. And after weeks of that, I just don't have the cravings anymore, and uh, but I'm still 100% susceptible. If there's a birthday or a holiday or whatever, and I eat some crap, immediately the cravings and the and the desire to binge come right back again. And that's not evidence that I'm a, I'm I'm weak or a loser. That's evidence that I'm very susceptible to sugar and carbohydrate addiction. So now that I know that about myself. I don't even tip myself with that. So you know, on uh, holidays and and birthdays. 
I'll cheat on on my carnivore diet with a keto diet. That's my that's a cheat day for me is having some broccoli and Brussels sprouts, as opposed to saying, well, I'm just going to have one little sliver of cake, because that's just a road to disaster for me, and I suspect for many other people as well. Mm. All right, this next one's from Cindy in Newport Beach. I listened to a great podcast of yours on hormones and I decided to get my testosterone checked and a hormone panel. And my testosterone is low. It's at two. I'm Very a, low. I'm a 42-year-old woman and I feel like I might be going through menopause even though I know that's really early. Should I take testosterone cream? I'm scared and I feel like it may make it worse. So I think she's saying like, you know, if she takes the testosterone cream, she's thinking, you know, she takes it and then her body may not produce it or something like that of why she's saying it may make it worse. Yeah, I understand. And so, but here's the thing, your body's already not producing it. So there's that. And so by replacing it, you're going to feel better and look better and stay younger and healthier for longer than if you keep your current testosterone level of two. Now, first and foremost, I want you to try to fix your diet because uh, there's there's quite a bit of meaningful research showing that if you eat a very low carbohydrate diet that's very nutrient dense, and that means it's going to include some fatty meat, quite a bit of fatty meat, you can actually increase your testosterone production uh, and also balance all your other hormones as well. If you get rid of the grains and get rid of the sugar and get rid of the, the vegetable oils from your diet, you're going to improve your hormones. If you start to do some sort of strenuous exercise, and this can range anywhere from CrossFit uh, to going outside and lifting heavy things for free to having vigorous sex in the bedroom, any of these things are going to raise your hormone levels back closer to normal. So I want you to use all the natural methods first and see if you can't raise that testosterone if after a few months of doing all those things, it's still too low and your symptoms of low T are still very severe, then I don't want you to be afraid of bioidentical hormone optimization. It's very safe. I've, I've done it for over a decade in my practice. Uh, there is no research that shows that it increases your risk of cancer. While you are using hormone replacement, your body probably will theoretically produce less hormone while you're using that. But as we said earlier, you're already not making any testosterone. So if your natural hormone uh, testosterone production went from two down to one, that's irrelevant because you're going to be using the, the hormone optimization to get your testosterone level up somewhere between 30 and 50. And some women 30 to 100 is where they feel their best. They have good energy good sex drive, their skin gets thicker, the, the little wrinkles get less noticeable, your, your energy, your stamina, your want to, your get up and go, all that stuff's going to get much, much better when you get your testosterone and your other hormones optimized. So don't be afraid of bioidentical hormones. They're very safe and they work very, very well. So I want you to talk about testosterone injections versus gels or creams. And what would you recommend? Like, let's say somebody, because I do think that it would be, you know, I think sometimes doctors will prescribe too much. And I think that's where, you know, people start researching stuff and they see all this stuff going on and they see that someone took it and then they ended up getting worse or whatever. And it's because instead of slowly adjusting their body to it, they went too far forward. So here's somebody who she's at a level two uh, for her testosterone. She's 42. What would be, would you say gels are better, creams are better, shots are better? And how would she slowly work her way up so that if her doctor gives her some, she's not like, oh, that's too much. Yeah, so most doctors who have been doing bioidentical hormone optimization for a while can make a pretty darn good guesstimate of how much you're going to need to get you back to the level you need to be at. So really, there's the, the gels are great, the, the creams are great, as long as they're compounded by a reputable compound pharmacy. 
because there are some smaller pharmacies that aren't very good at it and their creams are not consistent. So make sure they're get, they're not compounding it themselves. Make sure they're getting it from a reputable compound pharmacy, but also the, the testosterone pellets, which are, uh, in, it's a very minor procedure. They're implanted under the skin of your booty and they last, they last anywhere from two to five months, depending on the person's personal biochemistry. I think any of those are a great way to start. To my knowledge, there's not a bioidentical testosterone injection, like an intramuscular injection. Um, all the testosterones I know of that, that are injectable like that are not bioidentical. So I would stay away from the, for women especially, stay away from testosterone injections. But if she were worried that it might go too fast, too quick, or too high, too quick, she could start with a gel or a cream that's compounded. And just slow, and then get her lab work rechecked once a month as she slowly increased the dose. And uh, never discount your symptoms. Your symptoms are very important. And so, if your fatigue is much better, and your get up and goes much better, your sex drives much better, you're sleeping better. But yet, maybe your testosterone only came up to a 15 or 20, but you feel amazing. That's perfect. Stay right there. There, there's no reason for you to have to go to a 50 or 75 or 100. Some women do need to do that, but not all women. Some women feel amazing with the testosterone, total, total testosterone of 20, 30, 40. And so there's no really no point to go higher than that. And so pay close attention to how much your symptoms improve, how, how much better you feel, and then secondarily, so you'll use your, your lab test as kind of a marker. Oh, I feel amazing when mine's at 20 or 30 or whatever that number happens to be. So I need to adjust my treatment so that I can keep my number in that area. And, and so, yeah, and, and I think <clears throat> typically very few doctors who specialize in bioidentical hormones are going to take you too high too quick because they know that that can bring on a whole host of other side effects and complications and even risk factors if you go too high. Most bioidentical woke doctors are going to try to get you in the sweet spot, which for all women is somewhere between 30 and 100, varying by, you know, obviously individually per by woman. But most of the bioidentical docs that I interact with, we're not interested in, in taking you too high too quickly. Hey guys, I really want you to join our Intermittent Fasting and OMAD Facebook group. We're doing tons of giveaways right now for posting your before and after pictures and just for posting a question in there. We're giving away free protein shakes, some digest aid, all kinds of fun stuff. So please join our Intermittent Fasting and OMAD Facebook group. The link is in the show notes. So I think you brought up such a good point because I think that bioidentical versus traditional testosterone replacement therapy. Sometimes people, they don't realize that there is a difference between bioidentical and traditional testosterone replacement. And so when somebody is doing the shots, you, what you're saying is, if someone said to you, let's do a, a testosterone shot, it's going to be the traditional testosterone th uh, replacement therapy, not bioidentical. Is that what Almost I Almost certainly, say? yeah. There may be a bioidentical injection, but if there is, I'm not aware of it. I, I've never had access to that in my practice. Uh, the, the inject, and so some of the inject, injectables are not terrible for men, but I, I have just never used them in women. I, I don't think that's probably appropriate and it's probably not bioidentical. So let's talk about estrogen dominance for just a second and some of the ways that you can take care of that with supplements and some natural ways and also with testosterone. So reducing your estrogen, increasing your testosterone in the sense of all natural methods. So if someone came to you and said, look, I don't want to do bioidentical. I just need to figure out what supplements I need to take, what diet changes I need to do. Yep. What would you say? Yeah. So the, the most powerful tool and the most sustainable tool is to fix your diet. So many of the grains and legumes, beans, they are very rich in phytoestrogen. And also when you have a chronically high insulin level, because you're chronically eating too many carbohydrates, 
that's also going to affect your testosterone to estrogen level. And this ratio of testosterone to estrogen is very, very important. And so if, it, if that ratio is out of whack, it almost doesn't matter what your actual testosterone reading is or your actual estrogen reading. The ratio seems to be what's really in charge of how you feel and how, how you perform. So you got to fix the diet. If you, I mean, if you if you want to eat lots of whole grains and lots of soybean and lots of vegetables, and and you want to take a testosterone cream and you want to do a bunch of other stuff, I guess you can do that. But why would you not try to get at the root cause of this? That's going to be the most elegant solution. And if you're eating a, a diet rich in soybeans and other beans and some nuts and then lots of grains you're going to have a ton of phytoestrogens, which are estrogens that are coming from the plants that you're eating. That's not even up for debate. Um, women who are vegetarian or vegan, they, 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 they have, so, you know, a woman, if you get pregnant, it should be a roll of the dice, whether it's going to be a boy or a girl, right? That's just the, we, we think that's true, but in vegans and vegetarians, it's actually not a roll of the dice. They're much more likely to have, a female baby. And that's because of the phytoestrogen and the estrogen dominance caused by their diet. And if they do have a male, the, the male baby is, is like two to five times greater risk of having genital malformation because of the, again, the estrogen dominance and the effect that's going to have on the developing genitalia of, the, of the, the boy fetus. So yeah, you can't even pretend like the phytoestrogens in a plant-based diet is not going to have an effect. It is absolutely going to have an effect on you and any future offspring. So fix your diet. Stop believing that a plant-based diet is the healthiest diet for humans. It is not. It is not. It never has been. It never will be. Maybe maybe in two or 300,000 years when we've evolved, in, a, in, in not in a positive way, but in a bad way, then a plant-based diet might be the best diet for you. But it's, uh, if you're alive right now on the planet Earth, a plant-based diet is not the optimal diet for you. I promise you, that's not true. Yeah. Hey guys, I'd love for you guys to listen to a podcast that we did about the side effects from wine and the differences between natural wine and traditional wine. So go to chantelrayway.com slash wine and you'll see transcripts, you'll see some different episodes, but here's the thing. You can get your penny bottle now of dry farm wines and make the decision that if you're gonna have wine, to make sure you have the most natural, healthy wine in the world with no added additives, only natural ingredients. All the other wines out there have so much sulfate, so much sugar. Why put that poison in your body? So get your penny bottle now at ChantelRayWay.com slash wine. All right. I have two more uh, comments. I'll combine them together. One is anonymous and one is from Susan from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. One says, I heard a podcast of combining the benefits of DIM and NAC to get rid of estrogen dominance. Can you expand on that? But to let you know, I'm a 48-year-old woman and I think I'm going through menopause. I'm mm -hmm. also taking way too many supplements. Mm -hmm. I feel like I listen to more and more podcasts and I keep adding more supplements. If yep. you saw how many I'm taking, you would roll over in your grave. And yep. this is from Susan from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. She says, I have done three or four 24-hour fasts without even realizing it. Also trying to work out and walk one and a half hours a day. My question is, why did it take 40 years going around this mountain to figure this out? Thankful for you <laughs> and Chris from listening to him on the early podcast, and I still haven't weighed. Love, Susan from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So let's answer. Yep. Thank you, Susan. That's sweet. Let's focus on the one of the podcast of combining DIM and knack yep. to get rid of estrogen and just I think this is true I feel this way about me I feel like I I, I can really relate to this one because I feel like I can get out of control because you know I listen, have all these guests on and then someone else says oh take this supplement and I'm like okay and then I take this I mean yep. it can get crazy yeah and the, here's the problem there are many many doctors the traditional doctor the traditionally trained doctor is going to put you on a prescription pill and then they're going to add a second pill. And then they're going to add a third pill to take care of the side effects from the first two pills. And so uh, any traditionally trained doctor, you're going to 
be put on more and more prescription medications. So the here's the thing. A lot of doctors have broken away from that traditional model, which is good, but they're still stuck with their pill brain. And so they're not going to give you three or five or seven or 10 prescription medications, but they are going to wind up giving you three or five or 10 supplements. So pills are not the answer. Pills are never the answer. They never were the answer and they're never going to be the answer. If you are eating a proper human diet, which is full of fatty meat, eating some organs, eating some eggs and eating a little bit of vegetable, you don't need to ever take more than three supplements ever in your entire life. It is unnecessary. But these, these naturopathic doctors, the chiropractors, and some of the MDs who have really started studying the naturopathic model, they're still stuck in this mindset where the only way I can help you is to give you a pill. It's no longer a prescription pill. Now it's a, it's a nutraceutical or it's a supplement or it's a natural herbal tincture or uncture. All that stuff is unnecessary except for very specific little instances, right? And so I, I guarantee I'd love to see the list of supplements that this uh, lady's taking. I bet I could take my red pen and go through about 90% of them and say, yep, unnecessary, 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 unnecessary. But as long as you believe in the pill model of health, whether it's prescription pills or whether it's naturopathic, natural herbal pills, you're still a pill head. You're still, you're still discounting the power that food can have. You're still discounting the power that lifestyle changes can have. You still believe in the magic little pills. And so you're like Jack in the Beanstalk. You believe these magic beans are going to save the day. And it's, 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 it's a mythical belief strategy. You're basically believing in fairy tales. And, and not only are you believing in them, which wouldn't be that bad, but you're paying your hard-earned money for these magic beans. And that's, that's, I mean, at that point, that's just dumb. I'm sorry. I'm not being mean. I'm just being common sense. If you think that, that, that you're, that having optimal health includes taking a handful of prescription pills every day, you're wrong. If you believe that it, it's a requirement to take a handful of natural supplements every day for optimal health, you're still wrong. You're just wrong, uh, on, you know, in a different flavor. But it's still, it's foolishness. People are making money off, off of your, your magical belief in these magic beans. you got to stop that, okay? If you're eating a nutrient-dense, animal-based diet with a little bit of veg and some organ meat occasionally and some eggs occasionally, that's the most nutrient-dense diet on the planet. You're going to be getting all the vitamins and minerals and amino acids and fatty acids you need to build an optimal body. Mm. Now, so dim and that, yeah. That, that 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 does matter a little bit and has a little bit of an effect if you're eating a high carbohydrate grain diet filled with grains and legumes you might need to worry with all that but why not just fix the diet which is the root cause of all this then you could throw the dim and the knack in the garbage or better yet don't don't waste the money to start with that's completely unnecessary when you're eating a proper human diet You are just one of my favorite people. I love having you on. I just love everything you say. I'm always like, I feel like after you talk, I'm like, amen, yes. Like uh, I'm like the girl in the front row at church, like hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> well, this has been amazing. You are just a wealth of knowledge and I just agree with you so much. And I yeah. just appreciate all the truth that you bring and how you're really changing lives for people's health. So well, thank you so much much as a doctor that's my job right and uh, you know if I can help 30 people a day in the clinic I'm happy to do that but if I can help 3,000 or 30,000 people a day on my YouTube channel and my Facebook page and, and you know writing books then I'm actually a more effective doctor aren't I if I'm helping even more people achieve their their best health that's kind of my job and it's definitely my goal. So I'm never going to stop doing this. And I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you, Chantel. I appreciate it. Always amazing. Thank you so much for being with us. And you guys stay tuned. We have another episode coming up in just a few. Bye-bye for now.